Dr. Myron Roll, welcome to the podcast. I've really been looking forward to meeting you. Your story is remarkable. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's really an honor. Well, today, as we were talking before I hit record here, I, I want to take today's conversation as an opportunity to create a lot of action for the listeners. And so I want to teach people how to think effectively, how to make decisions well by framing principles atop your life experiences. So I want to start here. Road Scholar, NFL defensive back, neurosurgeon. I'm so impressed and a little intimidated if I'm if I'm being honest so uh take us inside your backstory how did all of this come together yeah you know my family's from the Bahamas and mm. uh you know my parents wanted uh me and my four older brothers to have um, role models uh, that look like us um, places and people who we could aspire to be and they put some very very important people in front of us uh like Kofi Annan, Paul Robeson, W.B. Du Bois, Booker T. Washington, and Ben Carson. And Dr. Carson's story, being a neurosurgeon, uh, the first to separate two conjoined twins from the occipital lobe and have both of them live, uh, that story really resonated with me. And so that planted the seed of neurosurgery in my mind. And my parents, knowing that we came from a, a limited resource setting of the Bahamas and we had a chance to be successful, good humans, good citizens, good leaders in America, they wanted us to have that firm foundation of education and have heroes and role models, people like Ben Carson. And so I think it really came from that injection and that belief, that push from my parents uh, for us to um, you know, see ourselves as, as belonging in this country amidst mm -hmm. our peers and seeing ourselves as successful uh, amidst it all. And that, that meant balancing school and sports and extracurricular activities and being good Christians, then we were gonna try to do all of that. Mm. Take me back, if you would. There was a moment, I think you were in middle school, but correct me if I'm wrong, where you, you took your journal and you wrote on it, um, NFL star, neurosurgeon, or something to that effect. I mean, not many middle schoolers do that. What what was going through your dreams at the time? That's fascinating. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. And you're right. Not a lot of people were, were thinking about that. But yeah. when I read Dr. Carson's story, I said, you know, neurosurgery seems so cool. This gelatinous organ that gets moved around in this hard skull that we have that can control the way we speak, control our body temperature, control mm -hmm. our respiratory rate, uh, control our thoughts. I said, this is a phenomenal organ that I would love to pick apart and work on one day and so and, and hopefully save lives through this. And I always love doing things. So so Dr. Carson and that story uh, had me write down neurosurgeon. And then I was also very good at football. I was big, tall, strong, fast. Yeah. I was better than my competition, not to you know, pull any punches. I really just had a lot of success early. Uh, and so watching football on TV, I said, man, one, maybe one day yeah. I can get to the NFL and say, you know, Myron Roll, you became MVP of the Super Bowl. What are you doing now? And I could say, I'm going to Disney World. You know, the the the, the catchphrase that is said after the MVP of the Super Bowl. So, uh, I had I written these these two down, and it became real to me when I did write them down because it became something that I can look on, I can see, I can continue to go back to. And as you read the book in a two percent way, I did end up going back to That's that wild. journal, uh, and uh, it sort of reoriented me um, to to the goals that I set for myself when I was very young. Do you think there's any strength in writing things down in that way? Not, not at all to insinuate that we can manifest anything we want in life just by writing things down, but what was the strength for you in writing that down? What did it do? I, I think there is strength in writing things down, and not, mm -hmm. not to get too neuroscientific, but we have uh, this motor strip that's um, in our parietal lobe, uh, and the left motor strip controls our right side of our body. I'm right-handed. And so when you have to actually do this high-level cerebral thinking of you know, coordinating the muscles and activating the muscles to you know, have this pen or pencil in your hand and then putting it on paper and then forming sentences, you know, all of these processes working together. It's a lot of biochemical and pathways sort of moving at the same time. And so you are expending energy to do this. When you write it down, it becomes sort of a, a real tangible thing. You pick up this paper and say, this is the, the work that I've produced. These are the words that I put together. And maybe these words can come alive because now it feels more real instead of like an abstract thought or an idea that just floating in some ecosphere so I do believe there is um, there is purpose behind writing dreams and thoughts and tasks down uh, and I've uh, committed to that um, that routine uh, since then and even to this day mm. I had no intention of, of asking you this but 
because of your profession, I'm intrigued. And I was wondering, could I ask you just a question about neuroplasticity and neural pathways? We can change our mind by changing our thoughts, and there is physical restructuring that happens in the brain. Can you walk us through? I'm just thinking about breaking habits, creating new habits, setting goals. What really happens in the physical structures of the brain when we rewire our brain? When we think differently, yeah. like scripture talks about. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a great point and something that I, I, I enjoy, especially in patients uh, who have to relearn how to speak, relearn mm -hmm. how to walk, relearn how to do some of the activities of daily living after some major insult to their brain, whether it be a tumor or a bleed or a stroke. Uh, your neurons, you have billions of neurons in your brain, and you have these axons that connect cell bodies, transfer and signal information one cell body to the other, and those things happen so fast, so quickly, and over and over again. But when you have um, a part of our brain that either um, is, uh, let's just take, for instance, you have a patient who, who's got an injury, an insult to the brain. Um, the neuroplasticity of our our neurons that are alive, that are, are that are near where that insult happened, they start to take up almost like they compensate for the loss that they see to their neighbor to the left of them. So when they say, okay, well, you to the left of me, you neuron, I spoke to you before through this axon connection, but now I'm not speaking to you anymore because you've lost oxygen or you've died out or you've got infected or whatever, you had an insult. So I'm going to take over your role where you used to help produce speech. I'm going to now learn that and take that over. And so the brain has a way of using those peripheral neurons that are around the insult to sort of rechannel, rewire, and relearn some of these outstanding functions that we sometimes take for granted. And if you don't have an insult, I agree, there's also ways that, a little bit more difficult, but there are ways where you can activate um, the brain to think through or to work through processes uh, that it typically does not do or that it that it hasn't done on a, that doesn't do on a typical basis. And so the ability uh, for the neurons and the connect connectivity of our cell bodies uh, to 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 help us live, to help us grow, to help us mature, to mm. help us function through life and get through some of the challenges that we have or some of the tasks that we have to do every day is absolutely remarkable. And that's why I love the brain. I'm so fascinated by, by this conversation specifically because I am such a proponent of saying that transformation from the inside out beats self-help. We're not just changing our mind about something. We're changing our mindset, maybe. And, and I look at a scripture like Romans 12, be transformed in your heart by the entire renewal of your mind. And this is science. There's a physical change that happens that can change the course of our lives is what I hear you saying, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a powerful organ. No mm. offense to the heart, which keeps us pumping. It's our pump. Sure. It's our motor. Uh, no offense to the liver, the kidney. Uh, but this brain, with the the level of growth that it can it can make uh, based on our thoughts and based on our environment, based on the nutrients and the minerals that we supply to it, based on the sleep that we give it, based on the care that we deliver to it, based on the protection that we can provide it, uh, it can do some fascinating things and take us from one space to the other, take us from one task to another, uh, and even after injury occurs, you're able to you know still. Uh, have a meaningful life with purpose and, and using this 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 organ. So it's fantastic. I hope that's encouraging for people listening and watching right now because no matter what we walk through, there is opportunity for restoration, for transformation, for growth, and for healing. And so um, I'd love to dive in actually straight away because, again, your book is just fantastic, and it, it proves this brilliant case study for um, an overcoming life, a successful life, a resilient life, a steadfast life. You opened your book with a story about operating on a newborn when you were in your residency. This is obviously such a high stakes situation, but I wanna get inside your preparation for something like this. Teach us how you focus, how you develop skills so that they become reflexive. I even really enjoyed reading about how you watched procedures as you would film in sports take us in how do you think how do you make decisions like that well it's a, it's a blessing to have that two percent weight process the, the you know the process of making small steps small small gains small improvements 
every single day towards a larger goal. And that's what we write about in this book, this this 2% way of just trying to grow and get better. This particular procedure is a ventricular peritoneal shunt for children who have hydrocephalus. If you live in a developed country like America, like England, like France, uh, typically kids get this because they have uh, premature bleeds. Uh, there's this part of their brain that doesn't have really well matured vessels and then when they're exposed to the world and pressure gets larger they end up having a bleed and so that bleed clogs the fluid filled spaces in the brain and the head gets a little bit bigger if you're coming from a developing nation like the bahamas or like zambia or like sub other parts of sub-saharan africa uh, then it's typically from infection. And so, uh, but, you know, you have to sort of operate soon because children can decompensate from hydrocephalus, this particular disease. And so you put this shunt in and you have to put this tube into the fluid-filled ventricle. Then you bury the tube underneath the skin, bring it down past the ear, behind the ear, down the neck, over the clavicle, down the chest, and into the peritoneal space, into the belly, as if the baby is drinking uh, this fluid. They don't know they're drinking it, but the fluid is now redirected into their belly so it can be absorbed. Uh, and so, you know, I was having struggles with this case, but I committed to the 2% way process and said, I'm going to learn how to do this case from start to finish because I want to make this weakness one of my strengths. And so watching uh, our medical library at Harvard, how many of these neurosurgeons have done this case in the past, ones who are from America, from England, from all over the world, uh, talking to neurosurgeons who have done this case thousands of times and getting some of their rhythm and their flow on how they like to position a patient and what they should do next and all that. I used to um, look at articles to see how I can prepare for this. I pray to God and ask God, God, control my hands, control my nerves, temper me, cool me out so that when I go in, that I'm not feeling the anxiety of maybe underperforming or feeling like I'm not going to do well for this patient or their family. Uh, then I talked to my wife, who's a pediatric dentist and knows nothing about uh, neurosurgery, but talking to her and talking through the case to her, and she tells me at the end, hey, Myron, I understand what you're doing. That, to me, felt good because I said, now I feel like I have a command over this case because I told you everything that I need to do to make sure I was ready for this. So it was a small steps every single day, 2% and getting myself focused and ready to go. I also listen to music. I listen to some of my yeah. reggae music from the Bahamas to sort of mm. center me and get me right. I used to do that before football too. And so that put me in the right mind to go forward and do the job. If you were to flip that script and, and talk straight to the listeners and say, this is how you develop skills and think in a way that hopefully these skills become reflexive when you're in high stress situations, tack on one, two, three, takeaway tips, what do you think those would be then? I would say first it starts with uh, the mindset. I, I think nothing happens without sort of putting the umbrella of, okay, where am I trying to go and how am I going to get there? What is the process I'm going to take? You need to commit to a systematic process that blocks out the background noise and allows you to focus on those skills and traits that you need to work on. Then I think it's mobilizing resources. How do you mobilize the resources around you to activate the people who can help you get where you need to? I never, and you can, you know, Know this in my book I've never thought of myself as operating in a silo alone that I have all the answers I'm humble enough to understand when I'm short of a skill and that I need to pick up on something right and then I also think that um, repetition is obviously very important doing it over and over again working on your your craft and being honest with yourself to say you know what I'm just not I'm not as strong on this as right now that I should be. Let me add a little bit more time. Let me add a little bit more intensity. Let me add a little bit more attention and energy and focus and effort to this particular skill so I can get it right. And then, you know, I would say the last is making sure that, uh, you know, you you execute when it's time to, to perform. I think a lot of people have mm -hmm. performance anxiety. Uh, when it gets to the moment, they can do it. You know they can do it. You know you are capable of getting the job done. But getting over the finish line sometimes is, is the hardest part. And so if you just, you know, if you say to yourself, look, I put in the work. Other people have done this before me. They're no better than me. I'm no better than them. But they've got it done, and I can do it too. I belong in that same category of successful neurosurgeons or successful fill-in-the-blank. Then let's make it happen. Let's get, it. let's get the job done. I love that. So this goes right to a really rich principle you talked about in the book, and I'd love for you to unpack it. And you said this quote, it's not enough to be good on paper if you don't have the intangibles like grit, determination, pride, and ownership. Spend some time teaching this out, especially ownership. That's powerful. 
It, absolutely. You know, you, you have to own a process. You have to own, uh, a, 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 you know, for me, it would be patience and patient care. You have to own, you know, your um, your responsibility in that uh, in that setting. Uh, and to me, I think it's incredibly important to do that because then you feel, uh, and I personally feel, as though I'm in, truly invested, uh, that I have... I'm going to know who, what, where, why, when, and how these situation is, this situation is going to work. I'm going to know at 360 degrees around. If you wake me up at 3.30 in the morning uh, and I've got sleep and cold in my eye, I can tell you exactly what I need to know about this particular process because I own it, because it's on me. The, uh, the burden is on me. But no burden, in my opinion, is too heavy for me because God's always there as my helper to protect me. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to place that on me because I know uh, that it matters to uh, to the people who I'm trying to treat, the families that expect you know optimal treatment, uh, their communities that expect optimal treatment. It's it's bigger than um, you know just the pathologies, just the disease. You have to see your work and your performance having a reverberating effect uh, to make impacts past you know just just what's in front of you. And especially as a physician. You know, you can get caught up with, okay, this is a glioblastoma, and I'm going to take out this tumor and this brain, and that's it. But there's more than that. There's a, a life that's connected to that. There's a family that's connected to that. There's a community that's connected to that. There's other loved ones that are connected to that. Everyone is connected to what you're doing. You know, and, and uh, that's why the ownership of it, feeling like you are in command, uh, that, you know, puts your investment on a different level and helps you perform at a, at a high peak level. And that's been helpful for me, especially during a hard neurosurgical residency at the best hospital in the country. Mm. So mission and purpose guides your hands almost. That's a, that's a focal point while you're doing the procedure. Again, it's not just about executing well. It's about there's mission, there's life, there's purpose, there's a why behind this. And that drives you, right? Absolutely. It definitely drives me. And, and I think working on the brain is unlike any other discipline or subspecialty in medicine because you realize that these people who've come to you maybe a day earlier were outside walking their dog and enjoying, you know, Sunday tea. And now for some reason they had a stroke, they had a bleed, they have a tumor that got so big that caused seizures and they can't drive or they can't walk or they can't feed themselves. And then now you're in this pink organ that's pulsating in front of you and you are here with the blessing and the opportunity, God's grace, to hopefully do something and help this patient. And then you see the recovery process it takes after that. You, you get a different perspective when you realize that this is a this is a big situation and it, it matters it, there's importance and there's um, and there's a level of, of prof, um, profoundness to what you're trying to do uh, and you're doing it together with a team you're not alone you have people up supporting you but it, it's beyond just the disease I think in at Harvard at my particular institution we can often get caught up because we're so academic and so neck up, so cerebral, and you get so excited when you get some really weird disease or pathology, You're like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to work on that disease. But instead, not thinking about that patient or that family or that personal story or that narrative, it, it sort of gets disconnected from the whole process. And that's something that, you know, I've tried to stay away from as much as possible because it doesn't, it, it, it doesn't allow me to stay grounded on my purpose, my mission on why I'm actually doing this. Mm -hmm. When I was in sixth grade, my dad bought me Dr. Carson's book and it marked me. And as a little boy, I, I thought for a moment, gosh, neurosurgery is where I want to go as well. And, and I didn't end up taking that, that path in life. But even in what I've heard from you so far, I just see his legacy and his impact and, and the profundity of his impact upon you, Dr. Roll. Um, about him, you wrote, that he felt sure of his identity and also confronted by those who wanted him to fit into a box that didn't fit him. That was your, your story as well, right? Absolutely. You know, I, I talk a lot in this book about the feeling of awkwardness, social awkwardness in certain settings, feeling like your skin is not quite right for the, the environment that you're in, feeling that your back history and your experience is not quite right for the environment you're in, and seeing Dr. Carson navigate those those um, those treacherous waters um, with his intellect and his skill and um, 
and with a level of civility and a level of grace uh, that can only be bestowed upon you by, you know, a higher power. I, I said this is a, an absolute role model who has done it the right way, and and someone who I, you know, consider, uh, you know, a hero in many instances. And and for me, going from the Bahamas, 90, 95 percent black, to a suburban town of South Jersey where it was mostly white and hearing racial epithets quite often and going to a high school that was rich and prestigious where I'm coming from a home that for eight, nine years of my childhood, we struggled with keeping lights on and keeping the water on and had to ask for money and all these different things. We came from a little bit of an impoverished situation and then going to Florida State University where now I am amidst, you know, players who had dreadlocks and gold teeth and, you know, were connected to street and gang life. And I'm, you know, something a little bit different than them. And then going to Oxford where I'm a bit of a jock and standing outside of that circle of academicians and that very, very wow. intellectually rich environment. And then going to Harvard, where again, I, I feel like sometimes, you know, you're coming to Boston, uh, you're, you're a black physician, you got scrubs on, and in your patient's room, they tell you, yeah, leave, you can take my food because I'm done. Uh, and I'm like, no, I'm here to be the, uh, a part of the team to take out your brain tumor. And so there's, there's those elements that have uh, hit my story, hit my life. And um, But at the end of the day, I said to myself, you know, this um, – this journey is uh, is too important. Uh, it me it matters to me. It matters to the people who look up to me, uh, to allow you know those misgivings or th that discomfort to stop the mm -hmm. progress going forward. And committing to that two percent way uh, was a part of, of how I mitigated that. We'll talk about the uh, sort of the architecture of the two percent way here shortly. Uh, but when we were talking about how do you maintain focus, how do you develop reflexive skills, you're talking about being driven by, by mission, by purpose, that this isn't simply an operation, this is a life. I want to thread that through and just fast forward a little bit. Um, when you, before you started at Florida State, you're sitting in Bobby Bowden, Hall of Fame, legendary coach, Bobby Bowden's office. And in a matter of words, he said to you, Myron, this is less about you becoming a great football player. This is more about you doing what? Becoming a, a big person, if you will. I, I don't remember exactly what he said, but I was marked because the first question he asked you was, what was your favorite Bible verse? And I was marked by that moment when I read that. And I'd love to hear, you know, again, what does it mean to be developed from the inside out so that you have the ability to stay focused through all these obstacles? Take us in wherever you'd want. Yeah, you know, uh, Coach Bowden uh, was a devout Christian. Uh, God rest his soul, rest in peace. He just passed away not long ago. Um, he was different than the other coaches that I think recruited me around the country. I had 83 scholarship offers and was ranked the number one high school football player in all of America. And so mm -hmm. attending all of these different college campuses, they would sell you on graduation rates or so you on the amount of first rounders that were chosen uh, from that okay. school and from your particular position they would sell you on the ability to play uh, on ABC or ESPN every Saturday get all the big time mm -hmm. games where everyone's watching they would sell you on these things uh, but coach Bowden didn't even start there he didn't even talk about that initially he wanted to talk about uh, me developing as a leader as a human and uh, being a devout Christian, knowing that I was a Christian, he had this huge Bible on his desk, and he said, pick out your favorite Bible verse. I went to Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. That verse just gave me comfort knowing that God's not this sort of like, you know, super far up being, far extending being that doesn't walk with me daily. He's my friend. He's right next to me. He's with me mm -hmm. as I go through the ups and downs of life. And we spent 30 minutes just fellowshipping, just talking about Christ. He basically took me to church before talking about X's and O's. My parents felt comfortable with that. I enjoyed that. They, we all felt that if we went down to Tallahassee, Florida, that we could become a better leader, a better Christian, a better human, and then, you know, obviously become a good football player. Football was going to take care of itself, but we needed the, mm -hmm. the assurance that uh, Coach Bowden and others around him uh, were going to be committed to my growth and my development. And uh, that's absolutely what happened. I appreciate Coach for that. Mm. Well, let's turn this into a principle for my friends joining us today. And let's talk about turning down the noise of distractions. Because as you said, you had a ton of public attention turned your way pretty quickly after ESPN named you the number one high school football recruit in America. 
get this, guys, ahead of both Matthew Stafford and Tim Tebow. Now, again, here's the principle I want to teach. How do we turn down distractions to make sure we are making great decisions, not simply good decisions? Here's the example. You could have signed with USC in a heartbeat. There was a lure. It's L.A. The notoriety was there. Walk us through understanding and applying that principle of turning down distractions. Yeah, you know, you're right. Uh, the L.A. experience, Pete Carroll, they were winning at the time. Yeah. The Reggie Bush, yeah. Matt Liner. You know, this was a team that was hot. Everyone wanted to go there. I look at USC of my high school years analogous to what Alabama is kind of now, where every top recruit wants to be a part of that winning culture, that winning hmm. program. Uh, but I did realize that there were opportunities, uh, even though I was someone who – you know, sort of stayed away from the social life and the fast life that maybe other people would. I did understand that, you know, there would be opportunities in a large city uh, with, you know, the glitz and glam and even what they showed me on my visit, which was sort of a precursor to what I might experience. I mean, they had cheerleaders and they had all these other beautiful women taking me around and like, oh, you know, we, we know all your story. You're from the Bahamas. And I'm like, how do you guys know that? But they were like doing their deep, intense research on every facet of yeah. my life. I said, I'm only a 17 year old recruit. I can imagine when I get here on campus what it would be like. So the decision to think about Florida State, to think about uh, a school that was going to be committed to my personal goals, uh, that was that was important for me. Uh, I looked at my parents and the people who came before me, uh, understanding their sacrifice for me to have this opportunity to be in America, to play college football for free, get a football scholarship, to potentially be a Rhodes Scholar, to develop as a human and as a Christian. This was not something to become complacent. College wasn't a moment for me to party and just, you know, waste and blow this opportunity. This was a chance that my cousins back home in the Bahamas, my uncles, grandparents would have loved to have, but now I'm here. It's not press is not becoming of me to want to fail them or, or or blow this opportunity. So the decision to block out the distractions, I think, really came from remembering and understanding the debt that I had to repay by being so good and focusing on those goals so much uh, that the noise would be silenced and quieted and that I can get the job done and go to Florida State with a purpose and leave after three or four years with the goals accomplished based on you know the work that I put in, the blessings of God, my family support, and people like Coach Bowden who uh, walked me through the whole way. Hmm. Well, you said that your decision to accept the Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford and forego your final year of college football altered the course of your life forever. Why? Oh, uh, it really did. Uh, you know, I, I was recruited, uh, well, scouted by the NFL as a first or second round draft pick after my junior season. I had a very oh, good gosh. season, all American. Uh, I put my name into this scouting service that underclassmen can, and it sort of come back with some experts to tell you where you get drafted. I called my cousin Samaria Rollup, who played for the Baltimore Ravens at the time, and I asked him where his GM thought I may go. He said probably late first round or early second round, depending on how you run. If you run fast, it could be a first round guy. So that's seven, eight million dollars guaranteed signing bonus money. That's you know guaranteed roster spot. That's playing for a long time. That's all the things that I wanted in going to Florida State mm -hmm. instead of going to Dartmouth, Princeton, or Yale, right? I chose a Power Five big school for this exact reason. But choosing the Rhodes Scholarship uh, was something that I had to do because I could not postpone taking the Rhodes Scholarship. Uh, so I, it wasn't like it was a, an option at that point. I chose the Rhodes, uh, introspectively thought about what I should do, and they, and and. I, I felt that making this choice of developing myself as a leader, as a thinker, placing myself in a mm. position of being a role model and going, going and getting my master's in medical anthropology was going to set me apart. And maybe other young people can see my story and draw inspiration from it. And that, that decision really changed how my athletic career went because I came back and got drafted in the mm. sixth round, only made $50,000 guaranteed, and only played for three years as a backup and a special teams guy instead of being a star yeah. like I had been on my other levels uh, when I played football. So that was definitely different. But if I had to make the choice again, I would do yeah. it exactly the same way because I, I think would that really? when I see people now who look at me and look at my story and they tell me that they found 
inspiration through it, that they've gone for education and they've, you know, had had come to a fork in the road and decided to go with their knowledge and intellect before doing something else. It, it just it makes me feel like the decision was worth the while when I hear those stories of, of people who have uh, who, who've seen me and um, who have uh, you know looked at what we've done and um, been uplifted by it. I'm really thankful for your perspective in that, but I can't help but think there's a level of disappointment that you have to negotiate with in that. How do you negotiate with disappointment? How have you navigated seasons of disappointment in your life to be able to stay focused? Because obviously today, that you're in a successful career, you have a beautiful family, but your life hasn't been without heartbreak, without heartache, without disappointment. What happens when Myron Roll goes to bed at night and he has disappointment on his heart? What do you do with that? Uh, I, I hurt uh, just like anyone else, and I um, I feel pain. I um, I express my my emotions uh, through words with my my family, um, you know, and just try to be as transparent and unfiltered as possible uh, with the people who I know won't judge me for for what I'm saying to them at that mm. particular moment. Um, I try to go out and work out uh, and, and try to sweat it off a little bit, uh, listen to some inspirational gospel music. I have a few favorite artists like Tasha Cobbs and um, Kurt Franklin. Let's and go. Hammond. That's yeah, right. Yeah. So, so I, you know, I, I, I do these things sort of systematically in this 2% process of just doing a little bit every single day. And then, you know, I do find what's next. And this is, you know, I, I found this to be helpful for me. When I was cut from the Pittsburgh Steelers and they told me your services are no longer needed because we think that you're going to be successful being a president or a doctor somewhere. You're going to be good. You're playing really well, but there's a guy who's a little bit behind you who needs football. You don't need football. When I hear something like that, I get so frustrated, so disappointed. You know, I do take yeah. those moments of feeling like, man, I'm letting someone down. My expectations, other people's expectations are being ruined based on, you know, my lack of being able to stick on to this team. Uh, but it, it slowly moves away based on the fact that I say it's not enough to say what was me. I have more to do. And this 2% way process of now moving into my next goal, which is studying for the MCAT, and putting all I can into that, that sort of allowed the, the disappointment to sort of roll off my back and say, okay, I don't have time, honestly, to think about this, 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 the, to lament, to, to think about this disappointment. I have to think about getting a good score so I can get into medical school so that I can become a physician, so I can truly save lives. And then on the back end, I can be a neurosurgeon who also thinks about TBI and CTE and also helps the NFL as a consultant. So I can get in the NFL the other way instead of getting in as a player. So there's there's all that that I try to commit to. And having family and loved ones around, as I mentioned in the beginning of my answer, being able to talk to them and be very, very transparent and open with them and vulnerable, uh, that helps a lot as well. So the principle I want to I wanna just extrapolate from what you said and and for folks listening right now, what I heard you say, Dr. Roll, is this, is long-term perspective, long-term vision in life empowers us to keep our head down, to stay diligent, number one. Number two, it empowers us to develop grit and resilience when things are hard, when things aren't going our way. And, and those hard skills of life are so necessary for us to live a life of longevity is what I hear you saying. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I didn't mention in that last answer about going back to uh, my journal where I wrote down be a neuro, be an NFL player and be a neurosurgeon. Crossed off one yeah. thing on my list. My mother brought that back to me. Uh, and then the next thing was be a neurosurgeon. That was the goal. Let's go. Let's get after it. There's not enough, you know, especially being a young black man where people are looking up to me, you know, to sit back and wallow in, in, in sorrow and misery without actually getting up and moving and keeping myself activated to move to mm -hmm. the next chapter of my life. That would be unbecoming of who I thought I was as a role model and as a leader uh, to my, my, my mentees. Something else that I think was important in the moments when I failed or the moments when I fell short of uh, what I ought to do was the learning that I got after I separated from the moment, maybe about a month or so later, the learning that I took from that experience. What did I get from my NFL time? Yes, I look at it as a failure because I didn't play as long as I wanted to. I didn't make the Super Bowl. I didn't make the Pro Bowl. I wasn't a starter. I didn't, you know, wasn't on every single highlight on ESPN. But what did I learn from that moment? Well, I learned that I had some great friends. I learned that I know how to compete. I learned that I could 
play at that level. Uh, I learned that how many people really enjoy NFL, and if I tell them I'm a brain surgeon or a road scholar, they're kids at least. They're like, oh, okay. If I tell yeah. them I'm an NFL player, they're like, oh my gosh, you're amazing. So I, I learned that as well. But then I also learned that I'm tough. That no matter if I get got beat down and I was told that I can't do something or not, I'm still able to bounce back from that. And I also learned that maybe God was protecting me from a bad head injury, traumatic brain injury, my fingers being broken so I couldn't go on to be a neurosurgeon and hopefully help save lives in my next career, which I really want to do. So there were things that I took away from it. So I, I, I do like to sort of look back on the moments where I felt I failed, the moments where I felt that I wasn't myself. I got in fights as a young person. I had to go to court one time because I got in such a bad fight with a kid. And what did I learn from that? What can I take from that? And how can I not go back to those moments and sort of move forward from it? That's that's helpful as well. Sort of like a an audit or sort of a, a postmortem on 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 the, the this, that season of my life that was uh, you know sort of the the pruning season, and then we bear fruit in the, in the next one. And thankfully, that's been the case so far. The maturity in that perspective for your life, for your learnings, is is so profound. Who taught you how to think like that? Uh, that's definitely my pastors. Uh, my pastors really um, keep me incredibly humble and allow me to, um, you know, to to have a a larger view of of myself, looking outside of. Of, of who I am, you know, we get sometimes caught up in our own myopia that we don't take the 30,000 foot view on what is actually happening around us and what God may be protecting us from. There are blows and arrows that we don't even know are coming in our direction, um, but yet we are still standing and we're protected and continue to move forward. And uh, I have pastors in New Jersey. I have one back home in the Bahamas. I have one in Orlando, Florida, who's, they're all phenomenal. These are spiritual fathers who sort of helped me uh, walk through some of these challenging issues. When I've lost patients in the past, they've, I was called them first and asked them, you know, how, how can I deal with this? And I remember one of my pastors, his name is Pastor Darius Daniels. He would tell me, uh, you know, Myron, um, you know, you you have an MD at the end of your name, but it, it doesn't sound it doesn't stand for mighty doctor, right? It stands for medical doctor, right? You have a a limit to your human ability. You have a limit to how much you can do. Uh, God does the rest, and so as long as you did your best and put everything you could into that patient, if the outcome doesn't turn out the way you want to, uh, it's it's up to God's will, right? And and, and that's okay. And um, and so you can't you can't think that you are a Superman or beyond your own human abilities that you can save everybody who comes to you. That's impractical. I, I that was my first patient, so I thought I would never lose a patient. I'm not going to do it. I'm so good. I'm so talented. Oh, I'm at Harvard. Oh, everything's going well. People love me when I'm operating, but that's not the case. And so having someone like Pastor Daniels and my other pastors who speak life into me, uh, that's been very very helpful uh, throughout the journey. Mm. Well, let's go right to the 2% way. We've, we've alluded to it briefly in the conversation. What is it specifically, and why has it been so transformative for you? My football coach at Florida State, not Bobby Bowden, but Mickey Andrews, my defensive coordinator, he would challenge me and my teammates every day mm. to get 2% better on the practice field. He wanted us to grab small little steps of incremental growth and improvement uh, in our stamina, our ability to catch the football, our ability to tackle. And to us as players, we thought that this methodology made so much sense because you can't get 100% better tomorrow, right? It's not like you can double your talent in a day. And so when Coach just said, just get a little bit better, it felt realistic. It felt manageable. He'd go onto the whiteboard after practice and he'd put roll got 1% better, roll got 2% better. And it just, I just loved that it kept us accountable and it was realistic. And so I took this ideology and extrapolated it to life and so that any chance encounter I have any video I watch any book I read I'm trying to grab two percent from it to apply it to my journey to take small yeah. steps if I win each day and keep winning each day and feel good about the small steps that I'm taking uh, then over a month six month a year period I can see my growth and I can see my progress and so the two percent way this book that we wrote is it does go through my story arc from the Bahamas to Jersey to Florida to Oxford yeah. now to yeah. Harvard um, but it talks about some of the challenges that we face in uncertainty, doubt, feeling like you don't belong, social awkwardness, relational issues, workplace challenges, and how we mitigate these issues by taking this stepwise, systematic process of getting a little bit better each day. And something else that I find really helpful in this process, just as a neuroscientist, is we have six lobes in our brain 
frontal, parietal, occipital, temporal, insula, and the limbic lobe. And the limbic lobe is responsible for your reward pathway. So when you do do something good, there's a release of neurotransmitters that's excitatory. It makes you actually feel good about yourself. And I think often we can beat ourselves up if we don't get the job tomorrow or if we're not a millionaire yeah. next week. And so if we can do that, if we can continue to grow and continue to get better just little by little and feel good about what we're doing and feel that we've made this progress and this growth and other people can see it and be uplifted by it, I think we'll all be moving in the right direction. So we're excited about this book and that's essentially you know, uh, the, the purpose of why we want mm. to do it. Let's walk out of that framework just for a moment. And if you were sitting now for coffee with me or with uh, any of my friends here hanging out with us today, and you were saying, hey, Chris, hey, Joe, Sue, whatever, here are our four or five takeaways today to begin to install the 2% way into your life. Again, this is not about changing your life dramatically overnight. This is about incremental growth. Three, four, five things, what would you say that we should do today to make sure that we're putting ourselves on the track to install the 2% way in our life? Yeah, I'd say first is, uh, you know, finding a task or a goal or a challenge. You know, it's not hard to find things that we want to improve on or things that we find difficult or things we, we would like to attain in life, right? Finding that goal. Uh, the second thing I would say is finding an accountability buddy. I enjoy having people that can look into your journey and say, objectively, you're getting better. I'm seeing your move. Are you doing what you want to do? Are you getting more punctual like you said you wanted to? Are you losing that weight like you said you wanted to? Are you communicating with your wife, your spouse, your loved one, your parents more like you said you wanted to? Are you improving your ability to tie surgical knots so at the end of the case, you know, the knots don't come open, the wound doesn't break open so you don't get an infection, so you're a better surgeon? Are you doing those things? I think you also, as we talked about earlier, need to write these steps down. Write it down. There's something that goes into seeing yourself check off a box or check off a, something on your calendar or check off you know a list and say I've got this done I'm yes, good I'm done for the day I feel good about that that's obviously important as well and then I also think it's important to commit yourself to this and say you know I, I'm not going to be distracted or swayed by what's happening around me it's so easy to get caught up in social media and other media and other forms of people thinking that they've got it all that they're doing it all and you to feel like I'm not enough I'm not worthy. I'm not doing enough. I'm not moving fast enough. Uh, and so this process, it, it, it does take a little bit of self-discipline to um, to quiet that down and to stay committed to it consistently every single day. So I say those are the three or four things that can really start, get you activated on the 2% way. And I give several examples in the book of how I did just that, mobilizing resources, getting people around me, having a goal to do, blocking out the noise, writing things down, crossing them off, staying committed to this goal, and then executing and showing up when it's time to get it done because the world needs it for sure. I love that. So when you were applying for the Rhodes Scholarship, you sort of um, established four pillars uh, that you were going to use for your process. Number one, it was finding mentors who aid in the process. Number two, differentiate yourself from other candidates. Number three, apply the 2% way to each aspect of your candidacy. And then here's the fourth one because you tipped your hat to it in talking about how do we apply the 2% and it's this, don't let pressure sabotage you. Now, how do we tell the difference between healthy pressure, good pressure that stretches us, that helps us grow uh, versus unhealthy pressure that sabotages us? Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's a good question. You know, I think um, uh, negative pressure or, or, or pressure that sort of stymies us, uh, paralyzes us and, and doesn't allow us to physically move sometimes, frankly, <laughs> and doesn't allow us to allow our mind to stretch beyond whatever events or whatever moments that we're stuck in at that particular time. There's also the physical manifestations of stress that we also, also understand as scientists, right? The increase of cortisol levels that could uh, produce mm -hmm. lack of sleep that could produce acne that could produce different body odor that could produce you know um, uh, mood lability and frustration uh, that that could produce hunger pains and other issues in that respect could produce headaches high cortisol level is not something that we typically matter of fact when we see that as as physicians especially neurosurgeons we start thinking about things like pituitary tumors and um, you know adrenal adenomas and all sorts of things because it's not normal it's not a natural physiological process 
And so when we do stress ourselves and we do have that elevated level, we start to see the body change, even weight gain uh, or hair growth is sometimes in different places. So that stress to me is, is something that's clear. It's known. We have to sort of be able to identify it and stop it from happening. I think the good stress, I think that good pressure, that good feel of like, yeah, you know, some, somebody moving behind me and pushing me forward is the one where we still feel on balance, on rhythm. I never want to feel hurried. I never want to feel like I'm out of pace. I always want to feel like I'm in the right setting, that I'm doing this at my my tempo. And, you know, th- th- there's uh, ways to sort of uh, mitigate that by not trying to bite off too much, um, by taking small steps, uh, by checking in and, and pouring into people and things uh, that can sort of decomp- decompress you uh, when you know, the moments do get a bit heavy. So uh, I think that the delineation has to be made, uh, and I think it often doesn't, and, uh, and that's why you see some people spiral out of control uh, when trying to move through life, especially during challenging seasons of their life. Earlier in the conversation, we talked about doing something meaningful, being driven by a why, by mission, by purpose. And you said this in your book, quote, let your burning desire to do something meaningful destroy pressure. Let your actions be driven by your expectations for yourself, not external forces. So candidly, the second part is a challenge for me and I'm sure many others as well. So how do you make this work in your life? It's incredible wisdom, but I want people joined with us today to take that information and apply it so they they can experience transformation in this area of their character. Yeah, you know, I, I think when you have a, a purpose-driven journey, when you're moving towards a better version of yourself that not only gets you to cross the finish line for uh, who you want to be and who you need to be in this world, but at the same time, you're impacting and influencing others uh, with that step that you've just taken. I think to me, that is that is the ultimate um, repayment, as I mentioned before, the repayment for the sacrifices that people have made before us uh, to, to be here. It is about service. Life, and to me, I, I look at this, uh, this Bible verse in Matthew 25, 40, inasmuch as ye have done for the least of these, my brethren, ye have done unto me. If you're doing things for those vulnerable, marginalized communities, for individuals who may be boxed out or don't have that access as you move forward and you're able to uplift other people or bring them along too, I think, I think that shatters all those barriers shatters the walls it, it it decompresses you it removes that 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 stymieing pressure that we talk about and so that stress mm-hmm. and it sort of um, it sort of uplifts and 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 increases your trajectory to uh, to, to new heights that maybe you didn't even see for yourself so I, I always thought that you know if you're about being in a silo and about self-aggrandizement uh, in your walk and in your journey then you know, the, the stress and the pressures that come with these things um, become um, very, very burdensome and can weigh you down. But if you're moving in a, in a different sort of direction, uh, then I think it's helpful. For me, I've, I, I wanted to be a neurosurgeon to help individuals, to, to, to do more. I'm a global neurosurgery fellow at Harvard, or I've traveled to Zambia and operate on pediatric neurosurgical patients in a low resource setting. I've gone home to the Bahamas and created a Caribbean Neurosurgery Foundation to upscale neurosurgical capacity in, in a part of the world uh, that sometimes gets forgotten. So, you know, yes, I love to be a neurosurgeon. Yes, I'm, I'm appreciative that I'm here in Boston, uh, but there's more to the journey than just a title or just saying that I've made this step. It's, it's, it's about having that purpose, having that meaning, and that's when I think you really get the right pace and, and uh, you're able to sort of balance it all. Mm. This isn't just a job for you, isn't it? It's a call. Absolutely. No question about it. And uh, it's a blessing, 100%. When you hear the patient stories, their narratives, when they come back and tell you and the team uh, that you have uh, impacted their life in a way where now they're able to attend their prom because you helped save their life, or they're able to take care of their their young one and go walk the dog like they used to, or they're able to attend their daughter's wedding because you brought them back back, back from the brink of death, and now here they are uh, living a meaningful life life it just it, it warms you it makes you feel like you are uh, doing God's God's will uh, and that the work that you have put in up to this moment it matters and no matter how hard the 24-hour days can be our shifts are very long sometimes they're thankless but but when you get those kind of comments and when you see that level of appreciation and gratitude from the individuals that you're able to influence and impact uh, it makes it all worth it 
Hmm. Your dad repeated a phrase to you growing up, your life is not your own. What did that mean to you? I mean, what what mindset did that establish for you about purpose as you grew yeah, up? Yeah, you know, the life not being your own uh, was, was not so much that, um, you know, I, I wasn't here to think about um, the things that can keep me safe and keep me whole. Um, but but it gave me a perspective to look outside of uh, my own fulfillment as the primary target or the the only thing in life, right? The sort of the the solitary achievement that could happen is what I can get. Let's move the the angle and the fingers from this way and move it out because you will get more fulfillment and more lasting joy and more enduring sort of uplift from helping others achieve as well, right? If you can all do it together and you can all move forward, then as a team, as a unit, as a community, as a people, you know, if you can represent something bigger than yourself, you leave that impact that is indelible and that lasts for a long time. And I think my daddy saw um, potential in me. He saw what my future prospects could Mm. be. And I think he wanted to hardwire my mind to think about life this way and to make the decisions, especially the hard decisions with that in mind Hmm. we would be foolish to think that we can build our lives by ourselves and back to a moment you had actually with dr carson in person which is so remarkable he encouraged you to do this to make sure you learn the names and the stories of the janitors the people that work in the cafeteria i think for ambitious people driven people um it's not that we don't see people and walk over people, but the challenge of relationships is not to commoditize them like people are just assets for promotion in life. So walk us through how you work this out in your life. What does slowing down, learning how to listen, and genuinely becoming curious about others require? Oh, absolutely. I think that is uh, you know, a great, great um, piece of advice that Dr. Carson gave me when I was uh, attending church with him and his wife, Candy. I was expecting him to tell me something very, very scientific and technical uh, about how to do a particular surgery. Uh, But he told me about this, you know, very, very humble state of making sure I know the names of lunch ladies and janitors and say hi to them. And for me, uh, that makes things very real. And I'm going to be very, very honest with you because I want to be transparent in this particular moment. At my hospital, Mass General, most of the people who do work those service positions, food, transport, materials management, um, you know, clerks or, or, or checkout clerks, uh, most of them look like me. And most of them came from uh, environments that I've come from. And so being able to connect with that population that I think gets overlooked or seen through, uh, it does give me a little bit of sense of home. It gives me a sense, and most of them are immigrants too, uh, coming from Haiti, coming from Cape Verde, coming from Morocco, and learning their culture, feeling like I'm a part of of their journey, and and, and them feeling like, hey, I got a neurosurgical friend who's my buddy, and he can I could talk to them like about the Lakers game or the Celtics game, or talk to them about the new album that came out from Kendrick Lamar. You know, I could talk about these things, and it just, it feels... It feels like I'm, I'm whole. It feels like I'm myself. It feels like I haven't changed my identity. And it feels like I can connect with these individuals who, who I love. And, and sometimes I feel like they're a little bit underappreciated. I've walked through the hallways with my cohort of neurosurgeons, all wearing white coats, and all of them are white. Uh, and when I see these people come forward, the materials management or the food transport people, and they're like, Dr. Roll, what's up? And give me a huge hug and, and daps and everything. And, and then my colleagues are like, how do you know them? I said, well, I, I talk to them. Like I spend time and, and talk to them. You can get to know them too. They're great people. And, and uh, so the shock in their face that, that I had these, this level of relationship with these individuals was, was telling enough that We sometimes don't do enough to connect with individuals who uh, we think can't do anything for us or we think they're, you know, not in our purview. But for me, it it matters. It's important. And Dr. Carson's advice still rings true in my my temporal lobe, my memory. So I I know it at all times. I love it. I love it. Uh, Dr. Roll, you know, we all experience failure in life. But the challenge for many of us is to get out of our heads. How do we get out of our own heads and stop obsessing over either perceived failure or actual failure? Like we beat ourselves up in the inside. And honestly, I'd love to just kind of take this into the neurology of this, the neuroscience of this. So take this wherever you'd like. Yeah. You know, I think uh, a, a lot of it has to do with 
what we see and what we compare ourselves to. It's just the comparative principle where we just try to juxtapose our life with someone else, and, and especially someone in our age group or someone in our social circle or someone in our generation. What have they done and what am I doing? Am I not doing enough? Am I not enough? Am I not pretty enough or cute enough or smart enough or ambitious enough or wealthy enough or whatever the case may be? Uh, and that's incredibly dangerous. Uh, and, and so when you feel like you failed um, or, or, or anyone has you know, um, you know, fallen short, uh, to, to me, it's, it's really about uh, identifying you know, why, why are you being um, stymied? Why are you being um, stopped and halted by, uh, by, by this, this event, by this experience? And then it's also about understanding um, that other individuals have bounced back and have come back from, you know, even more dire situations than you have, and they've made it. And I think this is where I truly rely on my faith. I've seen people who are stutters, people who are drunkards, people who are adulterers, people who are prostitutes, people who are persecutor of Jews, people who are tax collectors, people who were just simple uh, Jews uh, in the village and had no sort of royal lineage. I've seen all of them be used for wonderful things, great things, to change the world, to change environments. So if it can happen to them, why can't it happen to you? And so uh, for me, I, I always go back to feeling that um, I am no different than those who have been helped before, uh, and that this situation is uh, is just a moment. Uh, weeping indoors for the night, but joy does come in the morning. And although that is something that we often say, and especially in black churches and all churches around the world, uh, it's something that I, I do hold on to. Uh, because it, in moments like that where you feel like you've let people down or you've failed, uh, or you've just succumb to comparing yourself to someone else, you do need to hold on to something. And, and that's, that's, that, that is what I hold on to. And I know it will pass. I know it gets easier. I know, I, know, I know it can happen for me because it's happened for others. And having people pour into me and comfort me and love me, uh, that also helps soothe, uh, soothe the hurt a little bit too. Hmm. Wow. Well, your book, The 2% Way, is available right now everywhere books are sold. I'm so thankful for this conversation today. Anything else you want to share with the listeners? Well, you know, I appreciate you for having me, and I really do. I think that this book Thanks, is, um, is, is exciting, uh, and it's got utility. When people first talk to me about this book, they say, well, you know, I can't be a Rhodes Scholar. I, I can't be an NFL player. I, I can't be a neurosurgeon. Well, that's not the purpose of the book. It's not for you to accomplish these, these goals, but it's essentially to show you that just just like you, there's been moments of my life where I maybe was uncertain or felt like I let someone down or felt like I did too much or I was too aggressive or I was, I was violent. I had a temper. I couldn't control emotions. I had to deal with racism or prejudice or feeling boxed out. All these different things, these human experiences that connect us based on a human to human level, not black, white, not surgeon to non-surgeon, it's literally human to human. Facing these issues, facing these challenges, how are we able to mitigate, get through, get over, and continue to move forward and get on the other side of that problem and say, you know what, I'm glad that's behind me because I'm here now to do better. And so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy that we wrote this book. I feel like it has utility for many different audiences and I'm looking forward to people really diving mm -hmm. into it. I'm so thankful for this conversation and for your time. Listen, I'd love for people to stay connected to you and to your work. Tell people how to Well, connect. I have a, a website. Um, it's uh, www.2percentway.com. That's where you can get the book. If you want to follow me online, I'm all over social media, uh, Twitter and uh, Instagram. Just my name, Myron Roll. I, I'm very communicative and responsive to, to people who, who like to reach out. And so uh, so we're, we're, we're fired up. And my wife, Dr. Latoya Roll, she's also all over social media. Media. And mm. so we're like a team. If you get to her, you get to me. It's it's all good. I love it. I love it. I just found you on Instagram and followed you. So again, guys, if you want to follow Dr. Roll, Myron Roll, R O L L E is how you spell his last name. But oh, Myron, what a conversation! I'm so thankful for you. Well Thank done. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.